Now, friends, as we come to the little book of Jonah, we come to a book that's one of my favorites. I have attempted in my ministry over the years to write on books of the Bible that were neglected. I've written on the little book of Ruth. I've written on the little book of Esther. I have written on several of the minor prophets. In fact, we're coming to one that I have written on Zephaniah, the dark side of love. And then we've done the same thing on subjects in the New Testament. We have discovered, though, that many now have followed along in this same avenue because we're trying to get people interested in the total Word of God. Now, Jonah is one of the books that actually has been ridiculed more than any other. Unfortunately, many Christians thoughtlessly cast aspersions upon this important book in the canon of Scripture without realizing that they're playing into the hands of the critics and innocently becoming the dupes of the skeptics. You hear a Christian say, when they hear a tall story, they say, "'My, that's a Jonah.'" Well, what they really mean is that it's something that it's hard to believe or it may be even impossible to believe. Now, this is a book, therefore, that has been attacked probably as much as any other book in the Bible. And I think we can see the tactics of the enemy here because in warfare, the tactics of the enemy are always to feel out the weak spots in the line of the opposition, and to center his attack at that vantage point. Now, judging by this criterion, many critics come to the conclusion that the book of Jonah is the vulnerable part of the divine record. Now, this is the spot where the enemy has leveled his heaviest artillery. As a result, The average Christian today feels that this is the weakest link in the 66 links of the chain of the Scripture. If this link gives way, then the chain is broken, of course. Now, is the book of Jonah the Achilles heel of the Bible? Well, it is if we are to accept the ridiculous explanations of the critics, the translators of the Septuagint, were actually the first to question its reasonableness. They set the pattern for this avalanche of criticism which has come down to the present day. And the method of modernism is to allegorize the book and to classify it with Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travels. And it's an ancient method, of course, of modernism, but today liberalism uses the same tactics, and they make of it an allegory that actually it never took place at all. Some of the extravagant theories of the critics are as far-fetched and fantastic that it actually is almost ridiculous. It's much easier, if they find it difficult to believe the book of Jonah, it's much easier to believe the book of Jonah as it's given rather than to believe these explanations. Now, there are some that uh, approach it like this, and I'd like to pass on to you some of these outlandish explanations of the book of Jonah. Some critics, and they do not have a scrap of evidence to support their claim, they claim that Jonah was the son of the widow of Zarephath. And that, my friend, is really reaching for it. Then there are some that have put forth the theory that Jonah had a dream in the ship while he was asleep during the storm, and that the book of Jonah is the account of the dream that he had. And I tell you, you've got to be good to dream up one like that. Now, we have a third explanation they come up with. Some relate the book of Jonah to the Phoenician myth of Hercules, and the sea monster. And again, there's no similarity at all. Again, they're reaching for an explanation. Then there's a fourth one. 
And this group claimed that Jonah was picked up. Well, they put it like this. They say, yes, Jonah was a real character, and he did take a ship to Tarshish, and there was a storm, but he was picked up after the storm and the shipwreck of the boat he was on by a boat that had a fish for the figurehead, and that this gave support for the record in the book of Jonah. Now, imagine Jonah being picked up after the storm, and I could well understand that he'd be unconscious, and when he began to come to, he would see the figurehead that was up on the prow of the ship, and that was in the shape of a great sea monster or a big fish. And I could understand how that he would feel like maybe he was in a fish at that time. But I'm of the opinion that after he recovered about the second day, he'd come to the conclusion he was on a ship and not inside of a fish. So it seems to me like this is rather ridiculous. Now, there are others. They go a little farther. They resort to the wild claim that there was a dead fish that was floating around and that Jonah took refuge in it during the storm. So they have a dead fish and a live Jonah. I'm going to turn it around and say we got a live fish and a dead Jonah before we're through, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Now, liberalism today largely takes the position that it's nothing in the world but an allegory. It's merely a fairy story and to be put along with Aesop's fables. Now, the producers of these speculations... They claim that the book of Jonah is unreasonable, and they bring forth these theories to give credence to the story. And it'd be very interesting indeed, I think, to get Jonah's reaction to their very reasonable explanations. Now, we must dismiss all of these speculations as having no basis of fact, no vestige of proof from a historical standpoint, and only in existence in the imaginations of the critics. Jonah was a real person. The record has been validated, and the message of the book is vital for this atomic age in which we live. It can be established that Jonah was a historical person and not a character from mythology. It can be ascertained on good authority that the account is accurate. It can be shown that the message of the book is of utmost significance, even for this crucial time in which we live. Now, first of all, let's see if Jonah was a historical character. I want to turn to a historical book, Second Kings is one of the historical books, and it has a record in the 14th chapter, verse 25, concerning Jeroboam the second. And in order to pick up the story, I want to drop back to verse 23 in the 14th chapter of Second Kings. Now listen to this. We have here, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned forty and one years. Now, as far as I know, no one has ever questioned the fact that Jeroboam the second lived, that he was a king in the northern kingdom of Israel, and that he reigned forty and one years. This is a historical record. Now, we are told that he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Now, will you listen to this? Verse 25, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath under the sea of the plain according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath-hefer. 
Now, Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom. Now we have here a historical record concerning him. And if you will notice, Jeroboam was a real person. Israel was a real nation. Hamath was a real place. And it's quite unlikely that this man Jonah that is mentioned here is just a figment of the imagination. This is a historical record, and it's reasonable to conclude that Jonah here is a historical character. Now, I had a liberal. He was a graduate of Union Seminary in New York City years ago. He and I were discussing this book, and he had heard I was running a series on it. He wanted to know my position, and I certainly let him know what my position was. And he said, why, Jonah was just a mythological character. I gave him this passage of Scripture. In fact, we went and got the Bible, turned to 2 Kings 14.25, and he read it over two or three times. He actually didn't know that verse was in the Bible. And then he said to me, well, that was another man by the name of Jonah. Well, I said, that's quite interesting. But I says, the book of Jonah says that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, I said, Jonah is an unusual name. It's not like the name Jones today. It's a very unusual name, and it would be strange that we'd have two prophets by the name of Jonah. But it's not impossible, of course. But I said, it says the son of Amittai in both places. Now, I would think that Amittai would be a little puzzled if he named two of his boys Jonah. He wouldn't know which Jonah he's talking about. And it's unlikely that there were two Amittais that had sons by the name of Jonah. And it's very unlikely that the man would turn out to be a prophet in both cases. I said the parallel is so strong here that you have to come to the conclusion that we're talking about the same Jonah. That reminds me of Mark Twain's answer to those who said Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare. His answer was that he agreed Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare but it was written by another man by the same name. Well, what you have here is not another man because he has the same name, and it is the same man. It's the same man with the same name. So it would be utterly ridiculous to try to come up with a second man fulfilling these requirements so that the time period, it fits in apparently at the time that Jonah had this experience that we have recorded here, so that you have the record here of Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, he was, therefore, a historical character. And the thing that makes it quite interesting is this. We have just finished studying Obadiah. Now, as far as I know, no critic has ever questioned the existence of a man by the name of Obadiah who wrote Obadiah. Yet there is not one historical record in either the Old Testament or the New Testament concerning Obadiah. Yet they accept him, but the minute we get to Jonah, they want to reject him. Why? because they want to get rid of the miracle that is recorded here, and they go to any length to get rid of it. But we have a historical record in the Old Testament. How about the New Testament? Well, I want to turn now to the greatest authority that I know of that's ever lived on this earth, and that's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he authenticated and gave authenticity to the historical character of Jonah and to his experience in the fish. Now, I'm going to turn first to Luke 11, chapter, verse 30. 
It says here, and it's the Lord Jesus speaking, "...far as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to his generation." Now, I turn to Matthew 12, verse 39 to 41. Now, will you listen to this? But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now, the moment that you question, then, the historical record of the book of Jonah, then you question the credibility of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's very strange to hear man make the statement today, as I've heard many of the liberals say this, Oh, Jesus was the greatest teacher that ever lived. Well, one of the marks of a great teacher is that what he teaches is accurate and truthful. If he's lying about things, he's not a great teacher. And then they turn around and on the other side of their mouth, they question the historical record of the book of Jonah. But yet, Jesus is a great teacher. And I say to you that if Jesus is a great teacher, then his authenticating the book of Jonah has to stand. But if you want to say that he was no teacher at all, you reject his teaching, then I can understand how you'd want to reject the book of Jonah. But I don't see how that you can accept the Lord Jesus' teaching and then reject the account of the book of Jonah. For he made it a matter of history, by the way, because he gave it that authority. And I think he did that purposely. I want to conclude this part of the book of Jonah, our introduction of it, I should say, by quoting from Sir Winston Churchill. He was speaking on the subject of the inspiration of the Scripture. Will you listen to him? We reject with scorn all those learned and labored myths that Moses was but a legendary figure upon whom the priesthood and the people hung their essential social, moral, and religious ordinances. We believe that the most scientific view, the most up-to-date and rationalistic conception, will find its fullest satisfaction in taking the Bible story literally and in identifying one of the greatest human beings with the most decisively forward ever discernible in the human story. We remain unmoved by the tomes of Professor Gradgrind and Dr. Dry's Dust. We may be sure that all these things happen just as they are set out according to Holy Writ. And friends, I like that very much, and I thought of that as I stood in that little country cemetery where Winston Churchill is buried. He's not buried in Westminster Abbey, but in that little country cemetery among his own people. And I thought of his testimony that he had given to the Word of God. Now, I want to bring in another item of introduction, because I want to put down a good solid foundation to the book of Jonah. Now, will you notice, we have said Jonah was a prophet, and he was a prophet, but his little book of Jonah is not a prophecy. There's not a prophecy recorded in it. It's actually a narrative. It gives the experience. It's just a record of an experience which Jonah had. Now, the point is that here it is among the minor prophets. What is the explanation of that? 
Well, the explanation of that is this, that Jonah, I believe, is representative of the people that God will preserve during the great tribulation period, and they are to be a witness to the world. That 144,000 sealed in the book of Revelation, they will be preserved during the period. Now, we find that same thing true here. The story in the book of Jonah is a beautiful story, actually. Charles Reed, the English literary critic and author, he said this concerning the book of Jonah. Jonah is the most beautiful story ever written in so small a compass. Now, friends, the book of Jonah is unusual in many ways. It is among the minor prophets, and Jonah was a prophet. But this little book contains no prophecy. It is a personal account of a major event in the life of Jonah. And as the narrator, he tells us in this little book his experience. And it carries two great messages. And I think the message that would be evident from the Old Testament is the fact that here you have in miniature a picture of the nation Israel in the great tribulation period, how God will preserve his people. Now, we also have here a marvelous teaching, and I'll deal with this later, concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because this is a picture and actually prophetic of that, as the Lord Jesus himself said. Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. He would be to his generation, and that would be in his resurrection from the dead. Therefore, the book of Jonah is not a fish story, which really disturbs the gainsaying world. They make a great deal of the fact of how impossible it is to believe it. Well, that's not the problem. The problem is that this is a picture of a man who was raised from the dead and of a throne that is yonder in heaven. And in the midst of that throne stood a lamb as it had been slain. And that lamb's a resurrected lamb. And a Christ-rejecting world will someday cry out, Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. You see, as a lamb he died, as a lamb he rose from the dead, as a lamb he ascended to heaven, and the picture of him today is a lamb in heaven. He's both the sacrifice and the sacrificer, both the sacrifice and the priest, and therefore he is both the shepherd and the lamb. And what a picture it is of him. Now, the most salient point that I want us to keep before us as we get into the story of this book of Jonah is this. The fish is not the hero of the story, and neither is the fish the villain of the story. Actually, the book's not even about a fish, although that fish becomes the all-important thing in the book of Jonah. The difficulty, and I would say it's the chief difficulty, is in keeping a correct perspective. You see, the fish is just merely window dressing and cake trimming in a play that's put on. Why, there are always certain props and there are certain scenes. Well, it doesn't make any difference whether Hamlet is played with a black drop or a red drop or a blue drop or a white drop in the background. What difference does it make? because that's not the important thing. And therefore, the fish is among the props, and it does not occupy the star's dressing room. We need to distinguish between what Dr. G. Calma Morgan calls the essentials and the incidentals in any book of the Bible, for that matter. Now, the incidentals are the fish, the gourd, the east wind, the boat, and even Nineveh, the city, as such. But the essentials here are Jehovah and Jonah. God and man, if you please. And that's what the book's all about. Now, 
conservative scholars has placed the writing of this book before 745 B.C. The incidents took place about that time. Some even place it as early as 860 B.C. But it seems, in my judgment, best to place it between 800 and 750 B.C. Students of history will recognize this as the period when Nineveh was in its heyday. The Assyrian nation was the great world power of the day. And it was destroyed about 606 B.C. And by the time of Herodotus, the Greek historian, the city of Nimrod had ceased to exist. And when Xenophon passed the city, it was deserted. But he testifies that the walls still stood, and they were 150 feet high. And historians now estimate they were 100 feet high and 40 feet thick. Nineveh, as we're going to see, was a great city, and we're told as much here in the record. Now, there are two approaches to the study of Jonah, and the one that is the most popular and the one that I have found followed by most commentators is to note the striking resemblance between Jonah and Paul. Both Paul and Jonah were missionaries to the Gentiles. Both were shipwrecked. Both were witnesses to the sailors on board the boat. And both were used to deliver these sailors from death. Now, there are other striking comparison. I think what your careful study will reveal, and we're not going into that. But Paul made three missionary journeys. And with his trip to Rome, and I consider it a missionary journey, there were actually four missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And the four chapters of the book of Jonah may be divided into four missionary journeys of Jonah. The first journey, of course, was into the fish. The second was to the dry land. The third was to Nineveh. And the fourth brought him to the heart of God. And that, may I say, is a very good and reliable division of the little book. Actually, that never satisfied me. I felt that there's more to it than that. And I tried to get an outline of this book away from making a comparison with Paul. And very frankly, I had difficulty. I had more difficulty outlining the little book of Jonah than I did the book of Revelation. It may seem strange to you. The book of Revelation is a very mathematical and mechanical book, actually. It divides itself. The liberal has said too long that it's a difficult book. Nobody can understand it. Well, maybe he doesn't. But actually, it's one of the simplest books that we have in the Bible. We just let it say what it wants to say. Now, I have another approach to Jonah, and it came about this way. I was waiting for the train one night in Nashville, Tennessee. I was returning to seminary, and at that time, I was working on outlines of the books of the Bible, where I started early in that type of a ministry. And I couldn't figure out an outline for Jonah, and I was having problem there. And when I got to the Union Station in Nashville, I discovered that the train was late, and I would have to wait 30 minutes to an hour. Well, I did. I'm sure what you do when you wait either in an airport or in a railroad station. I walked around for quite a while before I sat down. I walked by the popcorn machine. I walked by the cigar stand, and that's what they call it in that day. Today, they call them gift shops. And I walked by it, and I walked by the soda pop vendor. I walked by the restaurant in the station. I looked in there, and I just kept walking around. I came to the timetable. As I was looking at the timetable, it occurred to me that the book of Jonah could be outlined according to a timetable, either in an airport or in a railroad station. 
And there are three things I discovered that are on a timetable, and that is regardless of where you are, whether it's in a railroad station or in an airport. Three things that are important. The first thing that's important is the leaving of the train or plane. What time does it leave? And, of course, where does it leave from is important, too, because you've got to check whether you're at that place or not, and you locate whether you're leaving from a certain place, and then you find out what time it leaves. Then you have to find out the destination of the train or plane. They generally come by numbers or by names so that you want to get on the right plane. It's important to do that. In the early days, there was quite a bit of difficulty and problem of getting on the right plane. A friend of mine was telling me about a trip that he made out of Chicago. I think that he was on the way to New York City or someplace in the east. He'd come from California, and he got on the plane that he thought was for New York and found out he's returning to California. Well, I don't think that could happen today because they're very careful about that. But it is important that you get the time it leaves and its destination and the time it arrives. Well, that's important because there may be somebody there to meet you. And I go to many places today where I'm speaking, and if I fly, I always let them know the flight number I'm coming in on and the time it arrives, because those are the three things that are important. The time you leave, your destination, and the time you arrive. Now, will you look at the book of Jonah like that? And if any of you have my book, you'll find out that we have this timetable in there. In chapter 1... Jonah leaves Israel. Evidently, Samaria, or Gath Hefer, his hometown. He left there. His destination is Nineveh. But he arrives in the fish. Chapter 2, he leaves the fish. His destination is still Nineveh. And he arrives on the dry land. Now, chapter 3, he leaves the dry land. His destination is still Nineveh, and he arrives in Nineveh. took him three chapters to do it, and he had to go buy a, a fish, but he made it. Now, chapter 4 is another remarkable chapter. He leaves Nineveh. His destination is a gourd vine or a trailer court outside the city of Nineveh, and he arrives in the heart of God. And that's a marvelous place for anyone to arrive. Now, I want us to note the book of Jonah from this viewpoint, so that when we get into chapter 1 here, we'll be leaving Israel. Our destination will be Nineveh, and Jonah will arrive in the fish. Now, before we get into the contents of the book, There's another item of introduction which I wish to mention. Now, the brevity of the book of Jonah is apt to lead the casual reader to the conclusion that there's nothing of particular significance here except the diatribe about the whale that swallowed Jonah. And, of course, it was no whale. Could have been, but don't think that it was that at all. A special fish was prepared, but be that as it may... The little book of Jonah has four chapters, but they're very brief chapters, and it's only about twice as long as the little book of Obadiah, which is the shortest book in the Old Testament. So actually, the book of Jonah is very brief, and for that reason, we're apt to pass over it. Each one of these little books, you can't call them minor prophets. Each one of them is a little atom bomb, just loaded with power, and with a program of God, by the way. Now, there are six significant subjects which are suggested and developed in the book of Jonah, which make it very relevant for us today. Now, we are going to discuss each one of them as we come to it 
in the book of Jonah. But I'm going to mention them now. Number one, this is the one book of the Old Testament which sets forth the resurrection. Now, this is what I mean. All of the great doctrines of the Christian faith are set forth in certain books of the Old Testament, and they give us illustrations. For instance, the book of Exodus sets forth redemption, the deliverance from sin for the sinner who comes to Christ, and it illustrates that. Now, in the little book of Ruth, you have the romance of redemption, you have the love side of redemption. Now, in the book of Esther, you have the romance of providence. And the book of Job, as we've seen before, we believe teaches repentance. Well, now, you can go through the Scripture and find out that the great doctrines of our faith are illustrated by a book in the Old Testament. Now, the little book of Jonah illustrates the resurrection, and it teaches the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, if you please. And if this does not teach the great doctrine of resurrection, then this most important doctrine of the Christian faith is not illustrated by a book in the Old Testament. And for that reason alone, I would say it is a rather significant book. This little book also teaches that salvation is not by works. It's by faith which leads to repentance. This little book is read by the Orthodox Jews on the great day of atonement on Yom Kippur. You see, the way to God was not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but by the blood of a substitutionary sacrifice provided by the Lord. And I think the most significant statement in the book of Jonah is in the second chapter. Salvation is of the Lord. He is the author of it. He is the one who erected the great building of our salvation. And he's the architect. Now, we find a third great purpose of this book, that God's purpose of grace cannot be frustrated. Jonah refused to go to Nineveh. But God's going to get the message to Nineveh. And the interesting thing in this particular case, Jonah's going to be the witness for God in Nineveh. And he didn't know he was going there, but he did. Now, the fourth great truth here is, God will not cast us aside for faithlessness. Now, he may not use you. You see, there are a lot of football players sitting on the bench. In fact, more sit on the bench than play in the football game. And they are only called out to play when they believe they can make a contribution to the game. If you and I are faithless, God may bench us, but we still got on our uniform, and he'll not cast us aside. Anytime we want to go back in the game of life and do our thing, why, he'll permit us to do it. This little book teaches that. And then the fifth great truth is, God is good and gracious, and we're going to see that in this book, how wonderful our God is. Now, uh, sixth and last great teaching here, and this is the verse I've written over the book of Jonah in my Bible, Romans 3.29. God is the God of the Gentiles. You see, when God chose Abraham, he said to the Gentiles, I'm going to have to leave you for a while because of the sin that's come into the human family. And I'm going to prepare salvation for you through a man and a nation, and I'll bring the Redeemer, the Savior, into the world. Now God has a salvation for mankind. And Paul says in Romans 3.29, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Well, The book of Jonah reveals that even in the Old Testament, God did not forget the Gentiles. Because if he was willing to save a woman like Rahab the harlot and a brutal, cruel nation like the Assyrians and the inhabitants of Nineveh, the capital, I want to say to you that God's in the saving business 
and he sure wants to save sinners. Now, these are the six great subjects that are dealt with in this little book. And I'm going to deal with each one of them when we come to it in the book of Jonah. Now, we are going to look at our timetable because we want to see what time the trainer plane lives. And we'll leave Israel next time. Samaria or Gath Hefer, we're going to head for Nineveh, but we'll arrive in a fish. Now, I'd like to read the first two verses here in the book of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Now this is the call and commission of this man Jonah to go to Nineveh. And the thing that I'd have you note here again is that he's identified for us as a prophet, and also he's the son of Amittai. Now, we have found out that he's a historical character. We saw that in 2 Kings 14.25. Now, his commission is to arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, the city of Nineveh is called here a great city. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It was on the Tigris River. Now, later on, we're going to deal with this matter of the size of this city because it is emphasized two more times in the book. In fact, a great emphasis is upon the size of the city. But here, the emphasis is actually upon the wickedness. It's a great city, but great in wickedness. It was so great that it had come up before God, and God now is determined that he is going to judge the city. That is, if the city does not turn to him. And actually, this man leaves his hometown of gath Hefer in the northern kingdom of Israel, and now with this commission and call, you would think that he's going to head for the city of Nineveh. And he does a very strange thing. He heads in another direction. I'm reading verse 3 now, "...but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, here is a man who is a prophet of God. And God calls him to go to Nineveh. Nineveh at this time was the great world power. In fact, it was the world power of that day. And this man does a very strange thing. God calls him to go to Nineveh. And Nineveh is in the east. You'd have to go east to go to Nineveh. And instead of going that direction, he goes down to Joppa, buys a ticket on the first boat for Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is way over on the southern coast of Spain. In fact, it was a city founded by the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were the great seagoing people of that day. And they had founded certain great cities along the Mediterranean, North Africa, for instance, and along the southern coast of Spain. In fact, they had gone as far as Great Britain. They were the ones gave it its name of England, means the land of tin. And they went there to get tin. So this was a city founded by the Phoenicians, and it was at the jumping-off place on the west. Now, we have before us here what I consider a greater problem than Jonah and the fish. In fact, I don't think 
we're going to have any problem with that at all. But we are going to have a problem here with Jonah. The problem in Jonah is not the fish, it's Jonah. And God asks him to go to Nineveh. He goes down and buys a ticket for Tarshish. God told him to go east. He goes west. You see, he liked very much what Horace Greeley of the New York Sun was going to say later on. Go west, young man, go west. And so Jonah decides not to obey God, but he goes west. And the question naturally arises, why did he do this? There are several explanations for this. And I want to pass them on to you. First of all, let me say that this man Jonah reveals he hated Ninevites. He did not want them saved at all. And they were a brutal people. Now, there's a basis for his hatred. Assyria was one of the most brutal nations of the ancient world. They were feared and dreaded by all of the peoples of that day. And they used some of the most cruel means of torturing people. And they could extract information from them very easily. One of the things that they did that we have heard of today, I'm sure none of us have witnessed it, they would take a man out in the desert, in the sands of the desert, and they would bury him up to his neck. Nothing but his head stuck out. They would put a thong through his tongue and leave him there to die as that hot, penetrating sun would beat down on his head. And it said that the man would go mad before he died. That was one of the nice little things that the Assyrians hatched up. They moved in a very unusual method. One of the reasons the Babylonians overcame them was because the slowness of the march of the Assyrians. They took their families with them. They had very little order in the army. It was just a mob moving out across the countryside. And as they would move, why, it was very easy to see that their disorder would militate against them. But when they moved down, just like a plague of locusts upon a city or a village or a people anywhere, they were so feared and dreaded that it is said on some occasions that an entire town or city would commit suicide rather than to fall into the hands of the brutal Assyrians. So you can see that they were not loved by the peoples round about. Now, we also know at this particular time, they were making forays down into the northern kingdom of Israel. You see, for a long time, it was Syria and the northern kingdom that fought against each other. They came finally into an alliance because in the north and to the east of them, there arose a Syria and a Syria of finally took both Syria and Israel into captivity. And they first began to penetrate into the nation they were getting ready to take. And they would come in, and they would make an attack upon a city by surprise, and they would take captive the women and then brutally slay the men and the children. Now, I don't know this, but... It's well and reasonable to conceive that in Jonah's hometown of gath Hefer, that the Assyrians had come down at one time. They probably came to his home. He may have seen his own father and mother just cruelly and brutally slain before his eyes. Or he might have seen his sisters raped by the Assyrians. At least we know that Jonah hated the Assyrians. He did not want them saved. And therefore, he goes in the opposite direction. He's not going to carry a message. Now, let's look at the second reason. Somebody's going to say to me, well, wait just a minute. His message was not one of salvation. 
His message was one of judgment. True, that was the message. But you see, this man Jonah knew God. I was very much interested in reading a liberal's record of this. He didn't accept the historicity of the book of Jonah, but he thought Jonah wrote the book and that it was just a story that he wrote and that it revealed the fact Jonah did not know God, and that's the reason he ran away. May I say to you, the very opposite is true. It's because Jonah knew God that he went in the opposite direction. He knew that if he went there with a message of judgment, and the people of Nineveh turned to God in repentance, which they did, He knew that if they turned to God, that God wouldn't judge the city. He would save the city. And therefore, Jonah didn't want the city saved. It just wasn't something that he looked forward to. And here is a man that goes in the opposite direction because he does not want the city saved. We're going to talk about that a little later on. Now, I want you to notice... uh, third reason here. Why did this man go in the opposite direction? Well, he is definitely a disobedient prophet of God. There's no question about that. He's out of the will of God, and in such a state, he is very much like the prodigal son. The prodigal son ran away from home. He didn't want to live under the will of his father, and so he goes to the far country. And Jonah's out of the will of God, definitely. Here, a prophet that was certainly not in step with God. And you're going to find that the last chapter, all of it, deals with this problem of Jonah, of how God brings him back into step with him. So that is a reason that I think is a good reason And it is a legitimate reason that this man Jonah goes in the opposite direction. Now, let me mention a final reason. You may not have noted this before, but have you ever noticed that God never used the prophets to carry a message to the nations round about? It is true Jeremiah sent one to Babylon. But God did not send messages to the nations round about. God never sent his messengers as missionaries in the Old Testament. The method that God used in the Old Testament is really the opposite method that's used today. Understand that Israel was to serve and worship God in a nation that was at the crossroads of the world, where three continents meet. And that, of course, is in this area here that joins Europe and Asia and Africa. And nations in that day, if they didn't go by water, this is the route they would take through the land of Israel. So God took these people, put them there at the crossroads, had them build a temple to worship him. And they were to witness to God by serving God, or, shall I say, by looking in. They had the inward look. The invitation was, come and let us go up to the house of the Lord and worship. And in that day, they witnessed by serving God at the crossroads of the world, and the world came to them. Now, somebody said, I didn't know that. Oh, yes. The Queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth. We're only given one example. And after all, in the New Testament, you have one son of Ham, one son of Japheth, one son of Shem that's converted. And you have those instances given. Ethiopian eunuch, Saul of Tarsus, and Cornelius the Roman centurion. And they're just examples. There were literally thousands and later on millions that were led to Christ. But we're only given in the book of Acts these three examples. Now, in the Old Testament, we're only given the one example of the Queen of Sheba. And she came from the ends of the earth. Why? She heard something. And she heard how they worshipped. And she got there and found out there was an altar for sinners. And that was the thing that brought her to a saving knowledge of God. 
Now, if you'll read the historical record, you'll find out not only did she come, but the kings of the earth came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So during that period, and it's a brief period to be sure, they did witness to the world, but they witnessed not by going out as missionaries, but by the world coming into them. Actually, for us today, it's the opposite. It was rather startling, I think, when the Lord Jesus said to those 12 men, and every one of them was an Israelite brought up on the Old Testament, our Lord Jesus said to them, "'Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel.'" And I imagine one of them looked at the other and said, "'My, this is something brand new. We never knew that it was to be done this way.'" And he told them, instead of come up to Jerusalem, he says, "'Beginning at Jerusalem, you're to go now to the ends of the earth, to Judea, Samaria, and on to the ends of the earth.'" That's the method today. And that is the problem. We like to criticize Israel for failure, but we build a church on the corner and expect the world to come to us. We're to go out to the world. It took me as a pastor years to learn this, but that's the reason we're on radio today. We're trying to go out and get the word out. We believe that's God's method today. But that wasn't the method in Jonah's day. And Jonah was surprised when God said to him, Arise, go to Nineveh. I think if Jonah talked back to the Lord, and if he'd been like Simon Peter, I think he did. And he was that kind of a man. This book reveals that. I think he'd say, Wait a minute here. You never did send Elijah down to Egypt. And you never did send Isaiah over into India. Why are you asking me to do something you've never asked a prophet to do before? I have great sympathy for Jonah, by the way. He's a little surprised that God would ask him to do it this way. This wasn't God's method. But this book reveals, as we've said, that he's the God of the Gentiles. Paul makes that very clear. And I read this last time, Romans 3.29. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, Paul says. And Jonah would say amen to that statement. Not at this moment, but later on, when he found out that God did want to save Gentiles. So now we have here, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. I've always called it Amittai, and now I've discovered that it's Amittai. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. And now this strange statement, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and we'll find out that he went to sleep down there. This, I think, ought to be the answer to a great many people who are having a hard time and a difficult time in wondering whether they're in the will of God. Now, I can't answer to you whether you are in the will of God or not, but I can say this to you. The fact that you're having a difficult time is not a proof that you're out of the will of God. It may be a proof that you're in the will of God. And if you're having it too easy today and things are just breaking right for you in every direction, I am prepared to say if that's all you're using to interpret the will of God for your life, then you're leaning on a poor broken reed and it won't hold you up in time of a crisis. That is for sure. Now, the illustration is Jonah. Now, here's a man headed in the opposite direction that God has called him to go. He's definitely out of the will of God. And he goes down to Joppa. And when he goes down there, well, there's no problem. He buys a ticket. He gets on board the ship. He goes down and he goes to sleep. Everything's lovely. And I'm of the opinion that Jonah could give a testimony, the kind of which I've heard. He said, I went down there to buy a ticket. I've wondered whether I was in God's will or not. He should have known he wasn't, but a lot of us say that. We wonder whether we're in God's will. 
And he says, I was standing in line to buy a ticket, and the man right ahead of me, the ticket agent said to him, sorry, but all space is sold. And he says, I was about ready to turn away, and the phone rang, and the agent answered it and said, oh, Brother Smith, maybe I should say Brother Goldberg, you're not going to be able to make the trip with us. Well, I'm sorry. What happened? Oh, you have taken sick suddenly, and you're calling us from the hospital. Well, thank you for calling. And then Jonah waited, and the agent turned around and said to him, Brother, are you lucky? My, are you lucky? I've just had a cancellation. And Jonah says, Well, I sure feel lucky. (laughs) I feel more than that. Maybe I'm in God's will. Why, he was able to buy a ticket. No problem. And he went on shipboard. And the weather report was a good report. Said they're going to have nice, pleasant weather. And this man goes down and he goes to sleep. And he says, well, I must be in the will of God. May I say to you, how many Christians are like that today? They think if they're having a difficult time, oh, I'm out of the will of God. And if things are going easy and everything works out, oh, we must be in the will of God. We are learning here at Radio Headquarters a great lesson. We started off out here. It was a breeze, friends. Probably there's been nothing to equal our growth on radio as far as we know. We went from about a dozen stations inside of three years to 300 stations. That's an amazing story, by the way. And everything seemed wonderful, and the funds came in. And then all of a sudden, we began to have difficulty. We found out we moved into the red. We had other problems that came up. And I want to tell you, friends, I began to wonder, Lord, are we in your will the way things are going? We want to be in your will, you know. And all of a sudden, I thought of the book of Jonah. Glad we got to it so we can talk about it, friends. May I say to you, I'm of the opinion that we were more in the will of God when we began to have our problems. It shows that the devil was getting a little uneasy. He paid no attention to us when we were small potatoes. And now that we are beginning to grow, he began to cause us trouble. May I say to you, just because you're having trouble doesn't mean you're out of the will of God. Now, everything seemed to be propitious for a very pleasant journey because everything had worked out so well. When he got down to Joppa, there was the ship there. He got a ticket. He had the money. I guess he could say, as many of us say today, the Lord provided the money for me, and I bought the ticket, and I got on board. And someone has called this the fortuitous concurrence of circumstances. And a lot of people interpret this as always being the will of God. Now, apparently, from this record, favorable circumstances are not always a harbinger that God's in them, and that this is the way God wants you to go. We know for Jonah, he's going the wrong direction, and he'll have to be turned around, but God will put him through a fish to turn him around. Now, we note here that God's man down through the centuries, both in the Bible and out of the Bible, have been men who have not found the going so easy. It hasn't been so propitious. Things have been difficult. I've always thrilled at the story of David Livingston. That man really suffered. It would have been very easy if I'd been penetrating dark Africa as he did I tell you, after a few of the rough experiences he had, I would have probably said in a very pious voice, I think it's the will of God first to turn around and go home. And John G. Payton in the New Hebrides, he met disappointment on every hand, and he had to overcome handicaps daily. But this is the way that God leads, and it was we've seen before that others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging. Yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, 
being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world is not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And that's in Hebrews 11, 36 and 38. We've seen that before. And we have also seen in Hebrews that it says, "...some escape the edge of the sword by faith, but others by faith were slain with the sword." So that you can't always interpret the good circumstances as being God's will and the unfavorable circumstances as not being God's will. Well, he's on shipboard now, and the ship pulls out. And I imagine that Jonah stood on the top deck smiling as he saw the land fade away in the distance. He said to himself, my, what a beautiful journey this is going to be. Now, we're going to find out that this man is not going to have it quite that easy. And I read in verse 4, "...but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea." Now, God was back of this storm. And I call your attention here at the very beginning to this. This storm is supernatural. It's not a natural storm. The storm on the Sea of Galilee, in which our Lord was sleeping in the boat, these men knew that they were going to perish. They'd been on that sea before, and they knew this was a storm they couldn't overcome and they would soon be at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee because it was a supernatural one. Only that time, Satan was back of that one to destroy the Lord Jesus. And that's the reason Peter came to him and said, "'Carest thou not that we perish?' And that's what they would have done. Now, here God is using a storm, and he's using it for a good purpose. He's going to save a city with a storm. He's going to turn the prophet around that's been going the wrong way, and he's going to start him going the right way. Now, will you notice, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. There was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was in danger of being broken. Now, these mariners, they were sailors accustomed to the Mediterranean, but they detected that this was no natural storm at all. And we read in verse 5, "...then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship under the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep." Now, may I say that I've come to another place in the book of Jonah that contradicts my former viewpoint, because I entertain the popular viewpoint that people generally have. I've heard it said that if a man gets out of the will of God and gets into sin, he'll be tormented with a conscience that will bother him, and he will just be in misery. Well, was that true of Jonah? Jonah's definitely out of the will of God, going the opposite way, actually running away from the presence of the Lord. He wanted to get as far from Nineveh as he possibly could, and he's headed for Tarshish. And now he gets on board. He feels everything is all right. He goes down and goes to sleep. And he can sleep in that storm. And even the sailors were frightened, and they were a bunch of pagans worshiping all kinds of gods. And so finally the shipmaster, the captain, the captain came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Why, you sleepy head, you. You mean you can sleep in a storm like this? Well, Jonah could. In fact, he's the only one that could sleep on board. He says, Now arise, Call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And so here comes this man Jonah now up on deck. That is, if he could make it up on deck. And he sees this great storm that they're in now. And the boat is apt to go to the bottom. 
Now, let me read verse 7. And they said, every one to his fellow, come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Now, I've already had several letters in on the book of Jonah, and actually a couple that disagree with me very severely. They apparently have read my book, and they know what I'm going to say a little later. And one of them feels like that I approve of this matter of casting lots, of gambling. Well, I hope the individual that feels that way will listen to me very carefully at this time, because I think gambling is an awful curse. And I think today that that method that's being used to raise taxes in our nation will ultimately corrupt our people and corrupt the nation. And in the end, why, it will be more destructive than it could possibly be helpful. Now, somebody else is going to say, as this person, why, this was a superstitious thing they, they were doing to cast lots to see this evil has come upon us. And they cast lots, and it fell on Jonah. Well, apparently God was in that and used that, but that doesn't mean that God approved that at all. I do not believe that Samuel was called back from the dead. I don't believe that old witch could do it. I don't think Satan himself could have done it. Only God can raise up the dead only God has the power over death and of the grave. Remember, the Lord Jesus said he had the keys there, and I don't think he's ever turned them over to Satan. Now, what we have here is the fact that they cast lots, and can God use that? Well, may I give you an experience I had in my first pastorate, the very wonderful pastor that I followed there, he'd so prepared the way for me, he told me about a family that had gone into spiritualism, and I'm not going to develop that particular feature today, but it was marvelous how God used that to bring these people back to themselves. But also he told me about another family where the little girl was attending the church, but he had not been able to reach the father at all, the head of the house. The wife attended, and she was a believer. A little girl was, a beautiful little red-headed girl. And so at Christmas time, he came to church. And so I, you know, whispered to several people to be friendly with him, and we all shook hands with him. And his criticism was that we overdid it, that we were too friendly. And so at Easter time, he came back to the church, and I told the folk, I said, he doesn't want us to shake hands with him, be friendly. So we didn't. I did at the door, but just barely did. And he said his criticism of the church was we were too cold. Now, that was a fellow you couldn't please at all. I went to visit him, and he just practically ordered me out of the house. He didn't want me to talk to him about the Lord. Well... It was about, I suppose, six months after that that I was getting ready for bed. In fact, I'd already put on my pajamas, and the doorbell rang. And I went to the door, and there stood this man, and he had a frightened look on his face. He said, could I talk with you? And I said, yes. And he said, I want to tell you the background. Now, he ran a dry cleaning place. He had a woman that worked for him at the desk, the cashier. And so she said to him one morning, she said, You know, I went to a fortune teller last night. And the fortune teller told me that I'm going to die suddenly. And both of them laughed about it. And then she said, and the fortune teller said that the man I'm working for, my employer, he's going to die suddenly. And they laughed again because they thought that was preposterous and ridiculous. 
But about two days after that, that woman, she stepped off of the streetcar. That is back in the days of the streetcars. And she was hit by a car that didn't stop. And she was killed almost instantly. Well, I want to tell you, when that man found that out, he really became excited. And that very night is when he came and knocked on the door. He said, I must be next. And I said to him, I said, well, I think that I can relieve your fear there. I said that the fortune teller had nothing in the world to do with it and had no prior knowledge. That's just one of those strange circumstances of life. We call it a coincidence, and I think that's what it was. And I don't think it means you'll die. He says, well, I want to be prepared. He said, would you explain to me the plan of salvation? And I got a piece of wrapping paper, and I got down on the floor in my pajamas, and I took a piece of crayon, and I outlined the plan of salvation there for him, and how God had sent Christ in the world to die for our sin. And that man was ready that night. He accepted Christ as his Savior. And you know, I always, after that, have thought that the devil pushed that fellow a little too far because he was responsible for the man getting saved. And very frankly, God can use things like that. He does. He says he'll make the wrath of man to praise him, and he can make the superstition of man. Now, these were superstitious fellows. God is going to use that. And they cast lots. Lot falls on Jonah. Now, X marks the spot where he stands. Now, will you notice what happens? Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us, What's thine occupation? And from where comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? Now, this man Jonah may not have had much of a time to talk to these sailors. He had, apparently had had some time, but maybe not too much. But do you notice what he's silent on? He certainly is no witness for God. And a man out of the will of God can never be an effective witness for God. I think that's something very important for us to keep before us. Now, notice what it is that he did not tell them. They say to him, first of all, we want to ask you some question. Since this evil has fallen on us, what is thine occupation? Well, he hadn't told anybody he was a prophet, you see. He kept quiet on that. And from where comest thou? And he didn't tell them he was from the northern kingdom of Israel and from gath Hepha. He said nothing about his hometown. And what is thy country? Uh, he didn't say that I'm a citizen of Israel. And of what people art thou? And he didn't say that I belong to the Israelite nation and the Israelite people. And we have a revelation of the living and true God. And I'm a prophet that's been called to go to Nineveh to bring a message of hope and salvation. And I represent the living God. Now, he hadn't said that. Why? He's entirely out of the will of God. Now, will you notice... He says in verse 9, and he said unto them, I'm a Hebrew. And that meant a whole lot. They were known as being monotheistic. That is, they worshiped one God and never an idol. They had no other gods before them. They worshiped the God who is the creator. And he says here now, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who hath made the sea and the dry land. This ocean right out here that you're seeing so stirred up by this storm. The God that I worship made that. And he made the sea, he made the dry land also. Well, these men, I think, knew about Israel, but they were pagan. They had no knowledge of the living and true God. And we're told here 
And then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. He had told them. Now, this man, he had a bad conscience, no question about that, although he could sleep with it very nicely. But this man, Jonah, had told him, well, he says, the reason I'm taking this trip, it's a pleasure trip, really. Actually, I had business over in Nineveh, but I decided not to go over there. And I'm getting away from my God, I know, in making this trip. But he hadn't divulged to them very much information, you see. Now, they say to him, why hast thou done this? And may I say to you, that is the good question that the unbeliever asks of the believer sometimes, and it's an embarrassing one. I had a man that came to me when I was pastor in Los Angeles, and he had visited the church. He was an unsaved man. I'd met him in a business in downtown Los Angeles and invited him to come to church. And he said to me that morning, he says, Is so-and-so a member of your church? I said, Yes. He said, well, I didn't know he was a church member. Well, I said, he's an officer in this church. I said to him, why? Well, he said, you know, I've known that man for several years. I've done business with him. I never would have dreamed that he was a Christian. Now, he says, if I were a Christian, I would not do the things that that man does. You know, it's embarrassing when an unbeliever comes and says to a Christian, why are you doing this? I thought you were a child of God. It's rather embarrassing, is it not? And I think Jonah turned about three or four different colors of red at this particular time. Now, they are going to ask him a very pertinent question, and that question is going to be, What shall we do for thee that the sea may be calm unto us? What can we do with you that the sea might be calm? Now, these men recognized they were up against a very hard decision, and they wanted Jonah to make that decision. Now, verse 12, And he said unto them, Take me up. Cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm for you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Now, Jonah recognizes the hand of God is in all of this, and that God was moving in his life at this time, and that the only solution to that problem of the storm was to get him off the ship going to Tarshish because God has already determined that this man's not going to Tarshish, but he is going to the place where God wanted him to go. Now notice, nevertheless, the man rode hard to bring her to the land, but they could not, for the sea raged and was tempestuous against them. Now, the man here, these pagan sailors, stand out in a good light at this point. They did not want to throw this man Jonah overboard, though they were pagan, though they were heathen. They did not want to throw him overboard. But they tried their best to bring that ship to land. They tried to get out of that storm, and they rowed as hard as they could. But they found out They could not do it. May I say at this particular place in the book, these pagan sailors stand out in better light than Jonah stands out. Actually, they stand out as rather outstanding men. They didn't want to throw him overboard, but they tried their best to get the ship out of the storm, but couldn't. Now, verse 14 of chapter 1 of Jonah. 
Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Now notice the change that's taken place in these men's lives. Actually, they're turning now to the living and true God. They're turning, of course, in their desperation. And they call upon God to forgive them what they're going to do. They have no other alternative. They can only do this. Now, verse 15, "...so they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging." Now, that reveals, I think very definitely, that it was a supernatural storm and that God was controlling all of this. Now, verse 16, and I think this is very important. Then the man feared the Lord exceedingly. And the fear of the Lord, we're told, is the beginning of wisdom. They feared the Lord exceedingly. What Lord? Their God? No. They feared the one who is the creator of the sea and of the land. And now they feared him exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice unto the Lord. That sacrifice points to Jesus Christ. There's no other alternative. And they made vows. Well, what vows would these men make? They'd make vows to the Lord that they now would serve him. And they turned through this experience to the living and the true God. So something has been accomplished by the storm and by Jonah being on board and now being thrown overboard. Now, notice what's going to happen to Jonah. We come now to verse 17 of this first chapter, the last verse. And the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now, I rule out the word whale as it's used in the New Testament. It's called a great fish, but the thing that's important as far as I'm concerned is the fact that the fish was prepared of the Lord for this special event. And I'm of the opinion that, again, we have a miracle in the fish in the sense that it was a specially prepared fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, it does not say that Jonah was alive inside of the fish. 